Last week's episode, we learned so much about raising children with good midos through, uh, you know, Sarah Blau and really using the Torah as a guide. And this week, we really continue with that theme with Mrs. Schoonmaker, who is truly a such a knowledgeable, knowledgeable person in so many areas of Torah, and especially within midos, to be able to apply all of her wisdom as to how parents can use different areas within the Torah. And she quotes so many, so many real Torah ideas, some incredible Mara Makomos to explain the, the depth, the idea behind each of these different types of midos. Literally, we went through like all the different types of midos and then to explain them and then how to practically do them and when to practically do them. So it's an incredible, incredible episode. I can't wait to share with you. Enjoy, enjoy the episode. Raising children in general is not easy. Throw in the desire to have passionate and committed Jews. Now that's next level hard. With weekly episodes on our parenting hierarchy, you will find the answers to your biggest parenting questions and gain the best practices you need to raise the children the way you want, to raise the Jews next door. Welcome back to another episode of The Jews Next Door. It is such an incredible pleasure to speak to really one of the leaders of our door, you know, who has such experience, such a popular speaker, a, you know, relationship counselor, a teacher in Michalah for over 20 years, to really one of the real, real leaders of our door, the truly inspirational people of our door to speak about raising the Jews next door. So thank you so much. Fresh off the plane here and coming from Eretz Really appreciate your time. Thank you so, so much. Thank you for having me. I don't know if I'm deserving of those uh, <laughs> titles, but I'm, I'm, it's an honor to be here and to be able to speak about these important topics. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, we're talking about Midos, about raising moral, ethical people. So what would you say is the, you know, let's dive right in. How, how does a parent raise moral, ethical, Midos, Dika, children? What's that? What would you say is the... I think the obvious, exa- the obvious uh, answer here is through modeling. Mm-hmm. But um, I'd like to say that it's modeling, but it's also the things that we ourselves praise. Mm. And children from a very young age see what we value by what we praise. You know, we're told, Ish kafi mahalalo. The shot of that is that uh, you can tell who a person is by who praises him. But the drash is that you could tell who a person is by what they praise. Mm, mm, so, you know, when kids, you know, hear us talking about somebody who's very successful in you know, financially or, or, you know, in some other way, then they learn that that's a value. Interesting. When oh, so you're not saying us, like what they hear, what we praise to them, like, oh, great job that you did this. More just what they hear our conversation is about. It's their gear said what's around the shop uh-huh. table, who we're, which amazing family in the neighborhood we're talking about right, and what right. they're doing. And, um, you know, that's how they learn really what, what hmm. we value. Wow. Wow. I love that. I love that. And what would you say is, is, is there a difference between just basic morals and ethics and, and you know, Torah values, like, you know, Torah midos? You know, we'll get into specifics soon, but is there, is there a difference in terms of how one gives that over to their children or it's the same, same idea? I think that a lot of it are, are just the basic ethics, but I think that in a Torah context, sometimes we put more emphasis on things than others. And uh, if we're ready to talk about the concept of praising, so we say, al yitalel adam b'chachmato, al yitalel asher b'ashro, Right. That, the, that knowing God is really the ultimate thing that we praise. Mm-hmm. So midos are a way to emulate Hashem. So it's going to take a spin that's more specifically Torah oriented right. and not just a regular, you know, concept of ethics. Totally. 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 Okay. So then I guess let's dive into some specific midos. Great. So first things first, you know, honesty. What's, uh, I feel like there's, there's a lot to say there, you know, if, especially when, when one already sees that their child is lying to them, what, what should one do about that? And, or, or like, first things first, how does one get their child to ideally be truthful? And then one, what does one do in a kind of in like an intervention type of way when one sees not working out so great? Okay. You're starting with a very controversial media <laughs> actually, because what, how we define honesty for young children is really something a little bit complicated Mm. Um, because at a certain age of development, a child's fantasy world often makes him believe that something is true, even if it isn't true. Wow. So when a child tells you, well, you know, I, you know, uh, I saw five, uh, you know, pink elephants on the way home from school. Is that lying or is that a fantasy world? Right. Right. As children grow, their concept of ethics versus manipulation 
also becomes more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's a little bit hard to really, um, you know, we, we don't want to call a kid out on dishonesty if it's really some kind of fantasy or maybe even some kind of a reaction under pressure. Right. So it, it's very, very, we, the basic mahalach we're going to use for children is to believe that they're being honest mm -hmm. and to be mechanech to respecting honesty. Mm -hmm. Meaning if a child says to you, you know, um, I already had two cookies, you might even say to them something like, wow, that for that honesty, you actually deserve the third one. Right, right. Meaning we want them to understand that it pays off to be honest, that they're living in a world which sometimes unfortunately convinces them that it pays to manipulate. Right, so how do, how do we, how can a parent explain to a child? Like when, let's say a child just, you know, a parent just wants to explain, you know, but it's really important that you're honest. And a child, let's say, says back, why? What would, what would be the correct answer for a parent? Okay, depending on the age of the child, yeah. for a young age, it's going to be just positive reinforcement. When they are honest, they get um, a lot of praise from us. Mm -hmm. They maybe even get some reward. Maybe they even see that they don't lose out by being honest. That's going to be that very young child who could have said that he only had one cookie, but he told you the truth and you gave, you gave him the extra right. one because he told you the truth. As a child gets older, I think it's really them realizing that ethics in Judaism, and here's where it's really going to be the Torah spin. You know, the Gemara and Masech Shabbos says um, that uh, that Hashem's stamp is truth. Mm -hmm. And um, the author of Kelm actually says this very interesting thing. A stamp usually comes at the end of a document, mm. which means that the truth always comes out in the end. Right, right. Wow. And that's what the child, and because he may see somebody cheating and getting ahead and people who lie. And what we're saying to them is, you know, you may be right on the, on the short term, mm -hmm. but in the long run, the truth comes out. Mm. And that's why with a long-term vision, that's why it has to be a more mature child who can understand this, is that people who cheat eventually either get caught or they're not respected or they get entangled in their own dishonesty. Right. So don't look at that short term. Look at the long-term picture. Got it. Got it. Okay. So honesty is being able to show them what's that the, the, the importance of it, of that eventually it's really not going to end up helping you so much anyways. Right, Got right. It. And if they can understand the more philosophical idea that, that since Hashem's midah is the midah of truth, right, right. so this is a way to be close totally. to Hashem. But that has, that's a certain age of right, development right. where they can totally. appreciate that. And what, and what would you say one does when, let's say, they do find that their child is not being so honest? How does one, right. you know, how do, I guess, like kind of like corrective in that, in that? Okay. I once actually was speaking to um, a group, uh, a bunch of principals of schools. And I came as the speaker, but I ended up learning so much from them <laughs> that it was, it was amazing. And one, one uh, principal said that what she does is that when she finds out, and this is true about in general, any kind of problematic behavior, but I would, I would re even relate it to what you're asking about right now. She says, so she'll, she'll call a student in and she'll say, you know why I'm calling you in today? Because I have a very high regard for you. And I was just told of something that doesn't fit in my perception of you. Mm -hmm. So how do you explain? the gap between how I perceive you and what, and, and, and what you've done. Uh -huh. And she puts it in the child in the, in the student's lap. Right. I thought that was like yeah, masterful, very strong. That's very, masterful. Very strong. And you have to really mean it. If you don't have a high regard for the, right. for the kid, then <laughs> they're going to know. They, always, yes. they can always yes. tell. <laughs> but, but she allows them to explain their own behavior. Right. You know, I believe that you're an honest child because I trust you. Right. And I think that in today, that's a very, very important message because when we don't, when we're too suspicious of our children, it ends up becoming like a self-fulfilling prophecy that the mm. child feels not trusted. Interesting. Child has to be, I, I, I can leave my things around. I don't, I don't think you're going to take anything. Like right. you wouldn't even have to say that to them. The basic premise is that we have a relationship of trust. And if I, and if I catch them doing something that doesn't fit that, I want to give them the chance to explain. Mm. Because first of all, as we learned from, there's a famous story of Rabbi Yaakov Kamineski was once accused of something that he didn't do. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we never want to accuse a child of something that we're not 100% sure is, is, you know, that they've really done something dishonest. Right. So by saying to them, this is a gap between what I think happened and what I think you are, and please tell me what you think, the child can either admit that they've done it. They can also plead innocent. Right. And it could be a discussion, you right, know, right, right. but, um, but we're, we're, we're basically working off the premise that the child is, is trustworthy. Hmm. I love that. Wow. 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 Okay. So I guess let's, let's go to another one. What about covered brios, right? Like being able to really respect both others, I guess, opinions and others space. Okay. Great. Great topic. Especially in today's world. Yes. <laughs> um, Revolva. Respect. I feel like respect just in general. So as a, as a, as a teacher, I, I often am just like, I don't even understand how my students and 
even not just my students, but students I see in general, it's just like, where's the basic respect? It's, it's no, so lacking. Yeah. So lacking. I, I, I don't know it's the chutzpah it, of the new generation. I know, but like. It's, <laughs> but they're lacking self-respect also. That's right. part of the problem. It's yeah. all, it's all over. Yeah. You know, their, their, their low self-esteem is also, you know, related by, related to this lack of self-respect. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. a very, very big problem in our generation. Um, I'm thinking Revolba in the Sefer Ali Shore, he talks about the fact that Kavod shares the showish of the word Kaved, mm. which means heavy. Right. So when you take somebody seriously, that's how you show them ultimately the biggest kavod. And, um, and Kalala and Kal share the same shorish, that the, the biggest curse is to take somebody lightly and not take them seriously. Mm. Wow. So when we take somebody seriously, it's even something as simple as making eye contact with somebody when they ask you a question. Right, right. Or, you know, like, like really thinking about how a person feels. And, um, you know, you're, you're serious. I take you seriously. Mm-hmm. And whether that's your opinion, your feelings, your preferences, I care. Right. And that's really Kavod. Revolva says something else very beautiful about Kavod. And I think we could explain this to children as well. He says that Kavod is the currency of values. He says in the physical world, when something has a certain value, you pay with it, you know, you pay with money. Right. But when, an, uh, when a fantastic person walks into the world, into the, into the room, you're not going to take out a million dollar, you know, mm-hmm. check and say, oh, here, this right. is for you. You're gonna show them kavod. Right, right. So kavod is the currency of mm. spirituality and values. Wow. And I say to kids sometimes, you know, we use this currency all day. The way you kiss your sitter and put it back on the shelf, the way you act on Shabbos, the way you stand up for an elderly person, the way you act when you go to the hotel. Right. Like right. we're always showing how we value people, places, times, days the way you dress for Shabbos. Right. So we are, we're always interacting in the world of current, of Mm. of the spiritual currency. So practically for a parent to be able to help a child to really, you know, value that meaning, because sometimes a parent could, could, could have all those ideas, but to be able to actually give it over to the child in a way where it's like, okay, now I understand, now, now I understand why I need to do it, but I'm actually going to do it. Right. So how do we get them there? I think we have to give them examples. I mean, the inanimate objects in a sense are the easiest ones because yeah. sometimes kids just like, you know, they see a sitter on the floor, they'll pick it up. Mm-hmm. But um, even saying like, oh, you know, I don't know if it's, it, you know, I don't know if that's so Shabbistic, if it's just so cov- such covered for Shabbos to do that thing, you know, or, you know, it would really show covered for your brother if you would allow him to express himself without cutting him off. Uh-huh. So you're saying like, if you, if, by in, including it in the language also, exactly. it, it shows like exactly. covered, covered, covered. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. Or out of covered for you, I will, you know, do this for you or uh-huh. something like that. I mean, like, I'm also showing the child covered. Right. And you know? it's like something that you're going to do anyways, but you could just include that little subtle and you're, message. And you're worthy of it. Right. I want to do this for you. Wow. Wow. That's very nice. I like it a lot. And I guess, you know, it kind of, Along the lines of, of that, you know, being able to be a no se o javero, being able to be compassionate for, you know, co- like b- giving the cover to the friend to the, to the level that you can even really empathize and really. No se ba'ol is one of my favorite topics. Um, I, I must say that over COVID, when there was so much going on and everybody was kind of living in very close quarters with each other. Um, I was working a lot on this meet with a lot of my groups in Yerushalayim and, and, you know, we were over Zoom at the point at right, that time. Right. And um, we're working a lot on no se ba'ol. And it's very, very interesting here. Um, there's so much to say about this, but I'll, I'll give you a little, you know, a little snippet. Um, the altar of Kelm says that rachamim is um, a, a very emotional um, kind of a mitza. Like, you know, I could tell you a sad story about somebody and you suddenly feel like you really like feel for them. He says, but what happens when people are not our type or the thing that's bothering them is not something that bothers us? Right. He says that that's when we, we know that all starts when Rachamim stops. Mm-hmm. If I don't resonate with you naturally, or the thing that you're, that's on your mind is not a topic that interests me. He says the place for no Sibol is in the Sechel, is in the brain. Mm-hmm. And he calls it Amal HaSechel V'Hatsir. Ah, so like that's where you have to really put the effort in. That's I'm going to use my imagination to figure out how does somebody from your age group or your um, value system, how do you feel about this topic? Mm. And when people are naturally our type, we don't even have to do no civil. We, we know how they feel. We, we, we feel for them. Right. But sometimes we have to really use our imagination and our sechel to stretch a little bit, to imagine what does it feel like to be you. Hmm. And the altar of Kelm also says that we have to often think abstractly to be no civil, because if the person is not from my, you know, I don't know, from my culture, from my stage, age, 
then I have to really think, well, what does this mean to them? And mm-hmm. what's the equivalent in my life? Right. It's- so how does, how does one get a child, like when they're parenting, to get a child to, to value that? To value, because it, if it's, if it, like you're saying, it's really have to put the extra effort in. So apparently a child is sad, like that doesn't, I don't care, <laughs> you know, just like plainly. So how do we get them to, to not just, because it's, it's more than just like the other things we've been talking about, because this, you have to really put that extra effort into. So how does that? Um... I think that when they do experience that there's a lot of pleasure in being able to stretch your psyche enough to really understand another person. Mm-hmm. So we might do an exercise with them first and then show them how that was amazing that they could actually, you know, stretch. Uh-huh. What do you mean um, by that? Um, I'll give you an example. I remember once there was a, um, somebody, you know, sometimes siblings have very different value systems. So you could have a very idealistic, uh, not materialistic, uh, you know, uh, teenager who has a sibling who's very into their manicures and their hair and mm-hmm. all that kind of thing. So they're like very cynical about their siblings' interests. I mean, why are they not more interested in spirituality? So you would say to them, well, what do you think that, you know, manicure means to your, to your sister. So I don't know. I don't care. You know, so, well, well, no, really, what do you think it means to them? And then if they say, well, maybe it's something that puts them in a good mood. Mm-hmm. So then we try start thinking, okay, well, what puts you in a good mood? Mm. And then the child will tell you what puts them in a good mood. Right. Um, you know, uh, go into a good share. And then you say, okay, now imagine if you couldn't make it to your share today, how would you feel? Oh, I'd be a crutch. Right. That's how your sister feels when she doesn't get her manicure. Right, right. Now, I don't have to agree with you. I don't have to. Um, but I have to understand how other people feel. Right, right. And by the way, mm, that's a very that's basic powerful. concept to know Sibol is that I don't have to agree with you. Right. But I have to be able to understand. Right. Wow. That's very powerful. That's very, very powerful. Going to switching, switching gears a little bit. Patience. Savlanas. It's, uh, I feel like this is probably the biggest one, <laughs> maybe, because I feel like, you know, for, for parenting and, and in ge- for parents also, I feel like for parents to be able to be patient, I'll never forget. I remember it, or like when I was like just early married, like really, really early. And I was like, am I ready to have children? Like I, the one thing I was thinking is like, do I have the media of patience? And I remember also when I had my, my Rebbe on for my, for my other podcast for education. And I said, I, I, I brought up the point of like, how do parents, you know, be able to be more patient with their children? And he says, patience is, is, is the key, like is the key to parenting. So how do, how do we both for ourselves, but also also to give it over to our children to help them to really be patient. For sure. Okay, here also I'm going to use for Volba and the Altar of Calm. Those are you know sources that I use a lot for Midos. So we look at the Hebrew word for patience, Savlanot. Um, the Shorish is Sevel, mm-hmm. which means to endure pain. And also Sabal. A Sabal is a porter who carries something very heavy. So really when people um, have to work on their patience, they're actually carrying the relationship or carrying the situation. And sometimes it feels a little heavy right. and it even causes a little pain. Mm-hmm. And um, the altar of Kelm says something very interesting. He says that savlanot is the ability to contain discomfort. It's not that I don't feel discomfort, but that I can contain it. Right, right. And it, that's his lesson, that it doesn't just spread out and take over. I always bring this example, and I think this is very relevant to our generation. You know, you could be driving somewhere and your children are tired and they want to get home and they're thirsty. And one child could say, when are we getting home? And you say, oh, we'll be home in 10 minutes. And you won't hear from them again because right. they'll just look at the window and they'll wait. And then you have the children who are the, are we there yet? Are we there? Every 20 <laughs> seconds. Are we there? Right. Are we there yet? Are we there? I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I'm tired. So one child was able to contain his discomfort. Right. And the other one, the comfort is taking over the, the mood. Mm-hmm. The, everything, everybody's affected by it. Right. So the ability to contain discomfort is really the way we work on Savlanot. Right. So the idea is we could teach a child that like, I know, first of all, we have to validate that this is uncomfortable for you, mm-hmm. but the fact that you can actually hold it and contain it is that builds your strength as a person. Mm. And, um, you know, again, it depends what age child we're dealing with, but sometimes it's going to be a lot of positive reinforcement. Like that was really, I saw that that person was annoying you and you just kind of sat there and you didn't, wow, that, that's amazing. That's really special. Right. And when a child is older, they can conceptualize. But one of the, um, one of the beautiful sources for this is we say this in, uh, when we say Hallel, we say, um, um, Zahashar Lashem Tzadikim Yavovo. And the altar of Kelm says that the Midah of Savlanot is the Midah of Zehashar Lashem Tzadikim Yavovo. Mm. 
And he explains why. He says, Hashem is able to handle all of our idiosyncrasies. Yeah. He sustains us and loves us, despite the fact that we're often doing things that would quote unquote annoy him, if you want to put it that way. And every time a person can overcome discomfort or annoyance, Zashar Lashem Tzadikim Yavovo. Right, right. I think it's like a- so, so you're saying being able to give that message over to your children, like that, that's like A, being able to, you have to work on being caring, you know, caring it more and, 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 and validating. First, first things first, like you said, validate, right? Sure. Second of all, being able to then understand and help them, on, help them to understand it's the ability to carry. Yes. And then the last part is like you were saying is the, that this is, this is a way to make us more like Hashem. Completely. I will say that on a very practical level, yeah. um, the Altar of Kelm recommends that if a child is going to be in a situation which will be upsetting, walking through the situation in advance and being prepared for the discomfort helps to deal better at real time. Oh, it's a very practical, yeah. you know, I, I give this funny example, like a woman who, who do these like birth preparation classes. We all know that you can't really prepare for a birth because mm-hmm. every birth is different. Totally. But the fact that you've kind of gone through the stages, it kind of like when you get there, mm-hmm. your mind is saying, been there, done that. Right. And it's easier. So if we say to a child, okay, we're going to go there and there's going to be possibly a baby crying or we're going in the car and it may be a long drive. And the child kind of walks through it in in their head. Right, right. Then often they deal better. Well, because also it makes a lot of sense. Think about what you were saying. If it's the ability to hold things, so in order to hold something heavy, you need muscles. So when ah, you're when you're doing that, you're 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 strengthening and stretching out the muscles to be able to be able to withstand it even more. Exactly. Ah, exactly. It's beautiful. I love that. I love that. I love that. Okay. And in terms of the mida of anava of being humble, you know, it's 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 a hard, especially within parenting. You're trying to. We always try to build up our children. So we want, because we want to build them up, we want them to be self-confident, but at the same time, we don't want them to become over pompous. We don't want them to be, you know, too gaivedic and full of themselves. So how do we help our children to both be confident, but at the same time, not too overly confident? Okay. So here, um, first of all, Revolba says that gaiva is not a mita that can be addressed directly for the fear of hurting a person's self-esteem. Mm. When you say you're, you know, we have plenty of sources in the Torah, Anochi Afar Va'efer, and you know, but, 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 but in today's world, you know, you try to do that to a child, you'll just like shoot, yeah. shoot him down completely. Totally. He says, therefore, Anava is a means that has to be attained through a back door, indirectly. He says, Tefillah, for example, creates Anava because I'm subservient to Hashem and I don't have all the answers. Mm-hmm. He says, Shimush Tomei Chacham creates a nava. Right. Because I'm so, I, I, I look up to somebody and I'm willing to drive them or carry their bags or whatever it is that I'm doing. And he says that asking advice from people, especially even somebody who theoretically is lower than you on the totem pole, he says that also, you know, builds a nava. Mm. Just looking around and saying, wow, a lot of people have a lot to offer me. Right. I would like to also say that I think that the difference between gaiva and healthy self-esteem and this is important for us to realize is that healthy self-esteem also means that you are willing to admit that you have special assets. Mm -hmm. It's not saying, Oh no, I'm not smart. I'm not talented. It's understanding that every asset that Hashem that you have has two directional arrows. Where did it come from? It came from Hashem. Where is it going? It's going back to improve his world. Right. when a person realizes that an asset was given to him from Hashem and he needs to use it, it doesn't let him get to, to a place of gaiva. Right. It's not like, it's not something that you personally was like, not as like, I mean, you're special, but it's not because you're, that you're incredibly special that you have this. It's, it's Hashem gave it to you. And it's like, it's kind of like on loan in a way. Exactly. And it has to be used. I bring this martial gaiva is when you take an asset and you frame it and you put it up in the museum for everybody to say, wow. Um, healthy self-esteem is like a road sign. It says to you like 20 miles to, you know, the city, whatever, meaning it just show me where I have to go. Right. It's not something to gawk at and say, wow. Right. It's a, oh, thank you. Now I know where I'm going. Mm-hmm. And that's. So, yeah. so is the idea that you're saying that parents should have children kind of like ask advice of other people in order to be able to, to understand that? I think so. As one of those backdoor ways, we might say to a child, like, you know, maybe it's your brother. What do you think about that? Uh-huh. You know, or, you know, I, I see that you really have a strong opinion about that. Maybe you want to just like ask, you know, just uh, see if somebody has anything to say. You know? yeah. But I think that even more so is teaching a child that he has special strengths. We're proud of those strengths, but everybody else does too. 
And, you know, you could say that, you you know, we say Bishvili Nivra Olam. So why is that not a very egocentric statement? Mm -hmm. Because if every human being is saying the same statement, then there's <laughs> nobody who's ahead of somebody else on the pecking order. Right, right, right. And that's what the Torah really believes. You're great. And so is the next guy and the next guy. And the Chadam Sheh and Shah. So we all, we, 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 we appreciate our greatness, but it doesn't put us ahead of somebody else right. because that could be that everybody's supposed to be saying that. Totally, totally. So we've, we've discussed all of the different like ideas behind each of these midos. When, what's like the right, I guess, either setting or scenario where a parent is then giving this over to their children? Like, how Okay, does that's this all a great question. Okay. Um, here's where it gets a little counterintuitive. A lot of the times... The, the time that we are most motivated to teach a mita is when we're seeing that the child is not, you know, at a moment of annoyance, you might, you know, want to say something, but usually that's the worst teaching hour mm -hmm. because in order for the child to really internalize, they have to feel that we don't have an agenda mm -hmm. and that we're not coming from annoyance. Right. So usually it's more like a bedtime story, a Shabbos table, Dvar Torah, um, something that we say in passing about something beautiful that we noticed about a neighbor or somebody else. It has to, the child has the best hearing capacity when, when they don't think that we have an agenda and then when they don't think we're annoyed. Yeah. So sometimes you'll, you'll see a child manifesting a media that you're not so pleased with and you might have to wait a nice, you know, few days mm -hmm. until you tell a bedtime story or demonstrate something through somebody else that will teach the fact that you're kind of going to bite your tongue mm -hmm. in real time right. because the hearing capacity is minimal at that time and wait until the child is open to hear. Got it. And, and when you come back to it at that time, the child's not going to be like, oh, you're just trying to teach me. Sometimes we have to wait until they're not going to think that. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I think that sometimes we have to demonstrate through the positive and not the negative. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're telling a story about some kid who did the same thing that the child just did three days ago, he may put it together. Right. But um, the Slana Marebi says something very, very beautiful. He says that we never use other people to demonstrate a negative mita mm. because it, the child picks up on that right away and they feel it's almost like hypocritical, you know, um, it's never like exhibit one, Mrs. Schwartz. Oh, she's a selfish person, uh, you know, okay, okay. or don't play with that kid because he is whatever, whatever. But he says, it's actually very beautiful to use other people to demonstrate positive mitos. Right. Do you know what I saw with this neighbor? I could not believe how giving they were and how, you know, so if you're working with a child on not being selfish, you may want to actually demonstrate to people and just, just some praise of somebody who did something really special. The son of every believes that children know how to connect the dots. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't have to like, you know, be right. in their face about it. Right, right. Got it, got it. Well, what would you say? Is there anything that um, that parents or people don't think to bring up within this topic of, you know, giving over midos and, and in a practical way that uh, people don't think to ask about? A specific mita, you mean? Or? Yeah, mita, or just in general, the idea of how to give over midos practically. I think, unfortunately, like I said before, unfortunately, a lot of the midos we focus on are negative ones. Mm -hmm. Don't be this way. Don't do that. Don't do that. And the don'ts, you know, it's it's been proven through a lot of different methods that when you give over a positive message, the psyche takes it in more than the negative. Right. And not only that, but um, this is an idea that I learned from Sarah Hannah Radcliffe, actually. She says that if you want a child to demonstrate a positive mita, you have to use that word a lot around the child, meaning you have to catch them. Let's say you have a child who you feel is naturally very selfish. You're not going to use the selfish word because it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, mm. but you're going to say, wow, that was so generous how you shared with your brother. And, and you may even, even if you have to point out something negative, you're going to say to him, I, I would wish that you would be more generous with your brother. Mm. Right, so as opposed to saying the negative, it's like when people say, I've, I've heard this before, that when, to say to someone, don't forget to, it is not going to end up, that's not like the message that's going to get them to do it. If you say, remember to, it's just, it's just such a, yeah. And I think that's something that we forget to do as parents, because again, a lot of our chinuch comes from sometimes um, annoyance or even fear. Right. Right. And therefore the, the messages are very often negative. And this okay. is supposed to be a fun Shabbos afternoon discussion and not a, you know, muster schmooze, yeah. you know. Right, right, right. Is, would you ever say that it's the right thing for a parent to kind of give in a way like a mini like muster schmooze on a, on a thing? Or is it not the... I, I mean, we do it all the time, myself included, and usually it doesn't have the best, the best effects, you know? know. Yeah. If we could be a little like just wait a little bit and think about, because it's a lot of times the muster schmooze is me letting off steam. Right. If I'm really thinking about chinuch, 
And, you know, the famous Pasuk, we have Hanoch Lenar, Apidar Ko, Gam Kies, Kinle, Asur Mimeno. We're trying to say, I want this child to internalize this value in a way that when I'm not there mm. to uh, enforce it, they're going to want to do it. Right, right. They could be scared of me. They could feel self-conscious around me, but it's what's going on in the, you know, in the recess in school when I'm not there, that that's where we're really going to see that the right. child's internalized right, it. Right, like Yosef, Yosef and Yaakov, the fact that ah. Yosef saw the Diok no Shavu, that's, uh, that's, the, the greatest goal. That's the, exactly. Right. Exactly. Any, um, any final message on this topic of, you know, practical aspects of, of raising children with good midos? I think it's important for us to help children understand what their strengths are in midos. Like everybody has a mida where they excel and a mida that is difficult for them. This mm-hmm. is coming from Rabbi Rucham Levavit says this. And the, you know, we all want to know what our topic is in this world. But when a person knows their best midah and their worst midah, then they have a lot, they have a lot more awareness of what Hashem wants for them in the mm. world. And we want to create a lot of positive energy around positive midos. And that's what gives the person the ability to also overcome the more difficult side of their mm. nature. We do not want them to feel bad and to have to hide their bad midah because right. everybody has, ba- has yeah, some bad yeah. midah. But we want them to be aware and to use, to, to find circumstances for the child to use their positive mitos in order to build their self-esteem and to give them call for the harder, harder aspects of life. Wow. I love it. It's beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. Wow. Thank you so much. So much incredible wisdom. That you, like, wow. <laughs> I need to like go over everything here. This is really like the, the, every single thing and the amount of the Torah that was flowing and uh, Revolva and the, the altar of Kelm. It's, Really incredible. Thank you so, so much. It really, is my really pleasure. It. it was very enjoyable for me as well. I really enjoyed this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of The Jews Next Door. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. I'd love to hear your takeaways. Reach out to us. Reach out to me at yair at jenoff.org. Hi at jenoff.org. You can check us out on the website. You could leave a question there. We'd love to be in touch. Please be in touch. Check us out on Instagram at Parenting the Jews Next Door. Hit me up on Twitter at yair Manchel. And we got, we're on TikTok now too. We have some great content, a lot of really great insights into parenting, tips, parenting pointers, reaction videos, and quotes. We have a lot going on. We have a lot of articles. You want to check it out. Check it out at jenoff.org. You won't be sorry you did. And I look forward to hearing from you. And if you haven't yet subscribed to the podcast, make sure you subscribe and share it with your family and friends. Looking forward to another great episode next week.